presenting for my name is will part one today we will be looking at three sonnets from shakespeare's 1609 quarto shakespeare's sonnets we will be looking at sonnets 134 135 and 136 and we will ask the question Is this line from Sonnet 136 proof that the Stratford man wrote the poems and plays? It's from the very final line, And then thou lovest me, for my name is Will. But these are companion puzzle sonnets. We printed in this order. This is All the Sonnets of Shakespeare, edited by Sir Stanley Wells and Paul Edmondson. It was published in 2020. According to one reviewer, it is an attempt to discredit doubters. Moore wrote, Edmondson and Stanley Wells have let their fancies fly. Wells and Edmondson say the sonnets can be read in any order and that they are merely thought experiments. They are mistaken using the poet's own words. Starting with Will. The phrase occurs in lines two and one of these poems. Line 2 of sonnets 134 and 136, and line 1 of 135. It is a visual way of connecting these three poems together. They are also connected by words related to money. Words related to law. One thirty five and one thirty six are connected by words related to numbers. Let's begin with sonnet one thirty four. So now I have confessed that he is thine, and myself am mortgaged to thy will. Myself I'll forfeit so that other mine. Thou wilt restore to be my comfort still, but thou wilt not, nor he will not be free, for thou art covetous, and he is kind. He learned but surety light to write for me, under that bond that him as fast doth bind. The statute of thy beauty thou wilt take, thou usurer that put forth all to use, and sue a friend, came debtor for my sake. So him I lose through my unkind abuse. Him have I lost, thou hast both him and me. He pays the whole, and yet am I not free. Line two has the word mortgaged. We have the word bond. Those are four words that tell us that he is using the metaphor of money for something that she holds. The sonnet, I've noticed that the word lose has an extra O in it. It's on line 12. Granted, it could be loose, so him I loose through my unkind abuse, but the grammar doesn't really say that. It says more that I lose through my unkind abuse. So that I took as an example of what we found in the dedication to the reader, that an extra letter is assigned to count those letters. 
in this sonnet we have it's quite a number for such a small poem we'll set that number aside and then continue with 135 whoever hath her wish thou hast thy will and will to boot and will in overplus more than enough am i that vex thee still to thy sweet will making addition thus thou wilt thou whose will is large and spacious not once thou safe to hide my will in thine shall will in others seem right gracious and in my will no fair acceptance shine the sea all water yet receives rain still and in abundance addeth to his store so thou being rich in will add to the thy will one will of mine to make thy large will more let no unkind no fair beseechers kill think all but one and me in that one will one of the things i noticed in this is that they have quite a few terms or several terms related to numbers line two line four line 10 in line 11. now i have noticed in my readings of the sonnets that whenever the poet uses the same type of word three different ways and here we have addition addeth and add it's a hint that something's going on beneath the beneath the surface of the text and he also adds over plus and plus is a synonym for addition so the logical question i ask was to add well in this small poem he actually makes a lot of about one word in particular so seeing as how he is asking us to add something up and that something seems to be the word will we add those up to get the but line 14 he says think all but well one and that tells me that he's instructing the reader to remove one from this number. Therefore, we now have 12 wills. We're gonna put that number aside as well and go on to Sonnet 136. If thy soul check thee that I come so near, I swear to thy blind soul that I was thy will. And will thy soul knows is admitted there, thus far for love, my love suit sweet fulfill, will, will fulfill the treasure of my thy love. I fill it full with wills and my will one. In things of great receipt with these we prove, among a number one is reckoned none. Then in the number let me pass untold, though in thy store's account I one must be. For nothing hold me, so it please thee hold, that nothing me, a something sweet to thee. Make but my name thy love, and love that still, and then thou lovest me, for my name is Will. Seeing as how we added up all the wheels in Sonnet 135, I figured that we were to add them up again in 136. And here we have wheels. However, the attentive among you will say, what about this line?
Well, what about it? It reads, I fill it full with wills and my wills one. But the first will is spelled W I L S, and the second. is spelled W-I-L-L. -L. Now this doesn't make any sense unless the compositor or the writer was telling us something because he spells will with two W or two L's rather on the, before this line and after this line. So what's going on? He could have easily corrected it. The compositor could have easily color corrected it. But we'll find the answer by asking this question. I L S spell. Well, I figure that it's an archaic way of spelling U I L E S. Now, let's go to the Oxford English Dictionary and see what this word means. Noun and verb transitive. Trick. Cunning procedure, artifice, usually in plural. It could also be a verb to lure, entice away, into, etc. It comes from the Middle English I L, perhaps from the Scandinavian or Norse Wellcraft, but that might be an old etymology. And he's saying something else here. will one. He's telling us quite simply his will is a trick. He's deceiving us. Therefore we see this line as I fill it full with wiles and my will one. So that gives us However, number one is reckoned none. This is a variation on the same line that we saw at the end of Sonnet 135, which says, think all but one. Therefore, the writer is telling us that we're to sub we are to subtract that one will from this number of six. giving us five wills. And what are we to do with this? Well, he says, I fill it full with wiles and my will one, and things of great receipt with ease we prove. What are we proving? Well, here we have an example where he says, will, will fulfill the treasure of thy love, and I fill it full, where he reverses the order. And I fill it full suggests that we are to do something with these wills. In things of great receipt, with ease we prove. Well, probably means grand total. I mean, we still use that term, grand total. These we prove, but we're going to prove. We're going to use this line, among a number one is reckoned done, as an instruction to remove one from the total number of wills we have. We are proving what's on the line below it. The 
then in the number let me pass untold. You'll notice that he uses the word the. The number, that's a specific number. So the question is, great receipt of wills? He continues. The writer pass. So what does pass mean? Well, if we go to the dictionary, we'll see it means go by convey and ship. He's saying he is being shipped in the number. He's being conveyed, transmitted in the number. How is he doing that? How is he being conveyed? Well, he's telling us. This line in this poem, what does untold mean? I figured untold means secret. So what's he saying here is simply what is identity is hidden in the number. To me, that's what this line means. So when thy stores account I must one be means that I should count for something, shouldn't I? which is followed by two lines that kind of clarify what he's saying here. For nothing hold me so it please thee hold, that nothing me a something sweet to thee. Well, hold me is saying that nothing is holding them, I guess. So he's requesting of the reader to hold the writer, whoever the reader is, whoever he has addressed the poem to. That nothing me is describing him as if he was nothing. yet it is a something sweet to the reader. When we count the letters, we'll find out that we have 34 letters. Now we put that number aside because this is gonna be important when we look at Sonnet 134 again. We come to the final couple. Make but my name thy love, and love that still, and then thou lovest me, for my name is Will. My name is not exactly what it seems, because the word make, in the context of this poem, means find my name. Love that still means continue to love my name. The final couplet is very important. Love this me, in which me refers to. real me. So what he's saying is you would then love the real me when you find my name. Name as well has often always been considered to mean 
because my name is Will. Well, you can interpret it that way, but the most crucial word in the line is the word for, and here's the reason. Straight from the Oxford English Dictionary, the first definition of the word for, which is emphatic or at end of clause for, or for chiefly before it, it's a preposition meaning. Against. So what is he saying here is simply my name is Will. Note the use of the italics and the uppercase W. When we see that in these poems, that means the name. He said, my name is Will. My name is Will. And finally, instead of my name is Will. So now we can go back a few lines and reinterpret. The thing hold me to mean hold me. Instead of nothing hold me, which means that nothing me just below this is a deep plaintive cry for recognition. It's reflected again in the line just above it where he says, I one must be. So let's reiterate, in the number let me pass untold means the number hides the writer. Now we're going to look at 135 and 136 again. Have the words overplus, addition, addeth, and add in sonnet 135 and fill it full in sonnet 136. Hold that we are to get a great receipt when we combine the numbers we find in 135 and 136. So we have 13 wills in sonnet 135, six wills in sonnet 136. But both sonnets tell us to remove one from these totals. Think all but one from sonnet 135, and among a number one is reckoned none from sonnet 136 to give us the first sonnet, five wills in the second, which means that the great receipt of wills is 17. That is the number. Seventeen hides the writer's identity in that one will. Then in the number, let me pass untold. In the number one is reckoned none. Line nine explains line eight, which is a rhetorical device called apposition, in which one line following another explains the previous line. So now we have a second meaning for among a number one is reckoned none. Among this number, one, meaning the poet, is reckoned or considered to be none, invisible. Let's take a closer look at Sonnet 134 because this one explains what's been going on in sonnets 135 and 136. 
So now I have confessed that he is thine. I that he is thine. He says, I myself am mortgage to thy will. So that means Three words, I, my, self, refer to the writer, not the name. He is mortgaged to the woman who is, he is addressing the poems to. Mortgage to the will means held captive to her volition. At 136, the line below hints how he is mortgaged. Again, it's an example of apposition. Let's myself, I'll forfeit. Myself means. the poet's identity. Forfeit in the context of this poem means the other mind meaning identity His store. He is suggesting that she put that other mind in her stores or remembers it. In the context of this poem, means come It gets even more clever than this, folks, because my self-file forfeit consists of letters with real identity, followed by characters. other identity, meaning thirty-four characters for his doubled self. And that's followed by with thirty-four characters. And that we're on the right track. And that's followed by which also has 34 characters. So here we have another example of the Omnia principle in which the repetition of something three times suggests and indicates that you are on the right track, that a profound truth is being concealed or revealed. So what does this line mean? That means she will not keep the other mind to herself. He is the other mind. He is not free of her will. In other words, whatever she wants. Explains down below in the next line what she's doing. Thou art covetous means she of her power, but
kind, meaning he is keeping the writer safe. Now, we can find two different ways to interpret the word kind. It can mean somebody who's gentle and good and behaving well towards others. However, Matthew Royden's Elegy to Sir Philip Sidney stands at 35 from the Phoenix Nest. He writes, The general sorrow that was made among the creatures of kind fired the phoenix where she laid, her ashes flying with the wind. So as I might with reason see that such a phoenix ne'er should be. Of course, that's talking about Sir Philip Sidney's death. But notice, this is kind. He, the other mind, is of a type. In just the same way that Matthew Royding is saying, among the creatures of kind. This 40, 34 letter line describes what he is again, and another example of apposition. How the writer is reversed things. In line three, he has the personal pronouns referring to himself on the left hand side of the line, and that other mine is on the right hand side, but now he has he, that other mind, on the left, and me on the right. He is the other mind, but what is the meaning of surety like? Well, in English law, there was is the surety of the peace, and I bet you it's still around. But in North America, it means an order in order protection is something protection of the author. So what he's saying in this line her identity wrote, put that in quotes, on behalf of the author. In other words, he Let me look at the next four lines briefly. Duty thou wilt take, thou usurer that put forth all to use. Essentially, he's saying she uses her beauty like a usurer, in other words, a tool. The statute meaning because of her beauty, it's a law, almost a law, that people will fall for whatever she says or do whatever she says. And sue so a friend came debtor for my sake, so him I lose through my kind, kind abuse. The first line is to put a friend in debt. It's also the other line. The abuse suggests the writer was somehow careless with them. Swap again. Him is on the left, and I and my are on the right, just to the right of him. Now, he's going to make everything more clear with the final couplet. Him have I lost, thou hast both him and me. He pays the whole, and yet am I not free. Him, of course, is the other mine. Because she has both him and me, 
both are now kind of owned by his lover. In other words, poet's secret. The triple him, me, and him slash he and I, me construction, okay? Him have I, him and me, he pays the whole and yet am I. That is another example of the Tria Centomnia principle. Pays the whole me. Well, the word pays means hand over. Well, in this context means is writing. That other mind gets the credit. And yet am I not free? is an indication that the writer, the poet, has the obligation to use the name. And if you look at this last clause carefully, you'll notice using 17 characters after the comma for his true self. In fact, it is so cleverly done that the number he is using plus the preposition referring to himself are essentially telling you, yeah, 17 is his true self. It's that number we saw, that great receipt. Matria sums for the two lines both equal 17 because they both have the uppercase H and the uppercase I in them. H is 8. I is 9. So once again we have the number 34 for his double identity. Now after all this we will connect the sonnets. Sonnet 134, myself I'll forfeit. not free because he has given up his identity. Not be free? Well, he is that other mind. They are bound in a mutually, uh, how can I put it? They are mutually connected. They are codependent on each other. Why? The other mind operates like a surety of the peace. He is surety-like. On behalf of the writer. Furthermore, Sonnet 134 says it's a bond, a contract, unwritten contract that the self, the poet's self, is concealed in that one will. Remember in Psalm 136 we said, in the number let me pass untold. We also said among a number one, meaning itself, is reckoned or seen as none or invisible. He confirms that again, or he restates that again by saying that nothing me, a something sweet to thee in Sonnet 136. He also explains in Sonnet 136 that instead of my name, so let's go over this a bit in it again in a bit different detail here.
is his name, my name. Mine from Sonnet 134 is in that one will in Sonnet 135. Claims in Sonnet 136 that that name is used in place of his real name. That other mine in the number is the number. For myself is untold, secret, hidden, concealed in that number. Now, what makes this more astonishing than just being all these things interconnected to tell you that he's telling us his name is not Will. But if you count the number of lines from the top of Sonnet 134 to where Untold is located, you'll find out that it is the fourth line, proving What is untold, what is secret, is in that one will. You see that in Sonnet 135 and 136, the last word is will, with capital W and all in italics, meaning that they are to be seen as equal, absolutely equal. Will with lowercase w and all uh, no italics, and will with the italics and uppercase show the rhetorical figure of antenna classes in which things are repeated in different ways. They mean different, different things. Now, furthermore, we see that. Thirty letters are trapped in the name Will, giving us another number in where he is reckoned to be invisible. Why not three in that one Will? In the number, let me pass untold. It's a second number. If we were to put Sonnet 136 above Sonnet 134 and count the number of words between the name Will and her Will, we will count that there are 17 words between the name and her volition. This is exactly in keeping with what was seen in the epistle dedicatory in the video Orphans and Guardians in which the name Shakespeare is located at the 17th position nine different ways. Now I'm going to present to you puzzle. This is just a simple digit sum puzzle. You add the digits to for the number 134 1 plus 3 plus 4 is 8. We do the same thing with sonnet 135, 1 plus 3 plus 5. We add the two together to get 17. Therefore, we can contend that 17 connects these two sonnets just as certainly as 17 connects sonnets 135 and 136. Great receipt or grand total number of wills. So in conclusion, these are definitely connected to the numbers 17 and 40 and each other. single poem to do three numbered stanzas. Let's 
the writer tells us. The name is not that of the real author. But deduced from the grand receipt or total number of wills. And that number is Another identifying number is 40, because we have seen 40 O's in Sonnet 134. 40 letters are trapped in the name Will. These scholars, Sir, Tan Sir Stanley Wells and Paul Edmondson, are mistaken. Poems meant to be read in sequence. The writer tells us in these stanzas is not his real name. He is in the number 17. He's the number 40. Presenting the 1740 man and his connections to these sonnets. In debt, which is one reason why he's used the theme and metaphor of money throughout these three poems, or stanzas rather. He was also trained in law. He's in this is Gray's Hall, Gray's Inn Hall as it stands today. He spent considerable time at his father-in-law's grand estate. Performances such as plays and entertainments in King Henry VIII's Great Hall in Hampton Court, which was originally, well, called in ancient times Avon. He saw plenty of entertainments at his family estate while he was a child. Now, of course, we're talking about Edward de Beer, the 17th Earl of Oxford. He's saying in these poems that he himself will shake spear. My name for my name is Will Part Two, in which I'll give further evidence that these puzzles exist and the identity of the man behind the sonnets is conclusive. <laughs>